Mitchell, thank you, Dr. Gano, and all God's people said, Amen. Wow. Happy Sabbath. Are you happy to be here? Are you happy to worship in God's house? I sure appreciate the singing, the praise. Brennan, thank you for the children's story. Your sister was supposed to give the second special music at the end of the church service, and she fell today, Ariana, so we want to keep her in our prayers. Let her know that we missed her. Welcome those online to your Shehala Seventh-day Adventist Church. For those of us that are in person, we are glad that you are here to worship the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. Last, uh, yesterday evening, afternoon, I was at a youth event with the Boges family and a lot of our youth. And we have some video we'd like to show you, some slides.
the record if you finish strong. Come on now. Alright, take it slow through there. I think this is what our church is about, right? We want to thank our teachers and our youth teachers. Train up a child in the way they should go. When they get old, they will not depart. Levi, you want to join me for prayer? So I have a Bible study with Levi. Come on up, brother. And uh, we studied the Bible together. And I asked him if he would read the scripture verse for today. Why don't you read the scripture verse for us there? So let's ask him to go to Matthew. All right, now give him a second to get there. Matthew 15, 26, and 27. Actually, Levi, give me a minute to get there. I need to look it up too. Okay, you got that? Matthew chapter 15. Now, I know you're not quite a youth yet, but you will be someday. That looked like fun, wasn't it? Thanks for the hay from Uncle Phil and Ginger and the Boges family for letting us use their property. And, and it was a lot of fun, too. All right. But he answered and said, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. And she said, Yes, Lord. Yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. All right. We're going to talk about that today. How about you? You want to say a prayer with me? All right, hey, let's go over here. You know I like to kneel. Let's go over here. How about you start and I'll finish? Is Bill out of the hospital? Okay. Let's pray for, let's pray for Bill, too. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the Bill Church. Um, please help us to have a good day. Thank you that Bill's out of the hospital. Please help the church to stay together and have his day and the rest of his Father. Amen. Dear Lord, thank you for the church that we can worship in. Thank you for my friend and your son, Levi, Lord. And I pray that you'll bless he and his mother and his family. And Lord, bless our church family. We have a lot of people that are sick. Lord, you know each one. We pray for not only our physical health, but Lord, our spiritual health in you. Thank you again for the blessing that we get to learn about you. Lord, teach us these Bible verses. They're a little hard to understand. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Levi. So it's also, as pointed out by Elder Phil, 
Mother's Day weekend. Thank you, Pastor. Don't forget that, fathers. We wouldn't have the youth without the mothers, right? We wouldn't have Levi without his mother. Now, it's just not biological. I want to thank the mothers out there that maybe raise children that aren't theirs. You're a mother, too. So just because you don't have any biological children doesn't mean you're not a mother. So happy Mother's Day weekend to you. I want to read a few famous quotes that are like, President Theodore Roosevelt said, Praying mothers are America's greatest assets. Don't you love that a mom that prays for you? Mom is someone who will listen to your problems until you are bored with them. Ellen Goodman said that. I love that. No one is poor, no one is poor who has a godly mother. Abraham Lincoln said that, one of my favorite presidents. Charles Wesley said, I have learned more about God from my mother than from all the theologians in England. What a statement. Charles Spurgeon said, I cannot tell how much I owe to the prayers of my good mother. So think about your mothers in your life, whether it was your biological mother, or maybe it was an aunt or a grandmother or somebody that helped raise you. Praise the Lord for our mothers. As you walk out, there are flowers for the mothers. As you leave today, don't hesitate to pick one up. Those are for you. When I think of my mother, she passed in 2010. I remember she had a mercy heart. Very soft, very gentle, very thoughtful, and she was a prayer warrior. And she always said to my sister and me, I am your cheerleader in your corner praying for you. How awesome is that? One last quote from Abraham Lincoln. I remember my mother's prayers. They have followed me. They have clung to all, all the days of my life. That's so true. So I also want to think about my wife, who is a mother. And uh, she has many of the same attributes that my mom has. She brings a lot of hope. She has a lot of faith. And I always find my wife praying. It's hard to get mad at my wife because if we ever have a disagreement, I call it intense fellowship, by the way. And she's usually right. I'll admit that. But I'll see her in another room praying. I mean, how can you get mad at her? And then you know the Lord's speaking to you saying, John, you messed up again. I'm like, sorry, Lord. I know you forgive me. Help her forgive me. But I think of those attributes. 1 Corinthians 13 comes to mind. And now abide. Don't pass the word abide. Abide means continue without fading or being lost. And now abide these three. You ready for that? Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these, and say it with me, is love. Now think about that. Faith is important. Hope is important. 1 John 4, 8, 1 John 4, 16. God is love and once we love god faith and hope are together united today's sermon title is the value of every crumb so i walked out of my house with this cookie it is a good cookie because i've already had one not today but i've already had one it's thick it was moist it was levi was amazing and my daughter looks at me and says dad Will you at least save me a crumb of that cookie? Are you going to eat it in church? I said, well, I don't know. We'll see how the Lord leads. She says, at least save me a crumb of the cookie. And I thought, wow, how fitting for today's sermon. And as I was listening to Sabbath school this morning, thank you, Jerry, all the different Bible verses that ended up being in today's sermon, I didn't even know. But that's an affirmation from God to me that this is what he wants to talk about today. 
It's interesting. Uh, when my wife and I go places, we're going to leave this week. I realized something. My wife and I haven't been on a trip, the two of us, for three years. I'm going to work on balance more in my life. Now, I've done family trips. My daughters are there quite often. But my wife and I, gentlemen, haven't been on a trip, just the two of us together, for three years. That's going to change this Thursday. I'm going to take her somewhere special. But when she goes somewhere special and we go to a hotel, she has a special hotel that she likes. And that hotel, when you get there, they open up the drawer and they give you a big cookie. Do you remember what hotel that is? Anybody know? But I said, sweetie, that hotel is $15, $20 more than these other hotels. And the amenities are nearly the same. They have the pools. They have the beds. Everything's about the same. But my wife looks at me and says, but this one has the cookie. (laughs) But for $15 more, I can go to Costco and get you 24 cookies. But they're not as thick as this cookie. That's the Doubletree Hotel. So we go to the Doubletree Hotel, and we have Sophia with us, and they pull out, there's three of us, and they pull out two cookies. What's wrong with that picture, Levi? There's a cookie missing. And they said, we're out of cookies. We were fighting for the crumbs left over. So let's go to Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21. We're going to start the story and try to understand the value of every crumb. Matthew chapter 21. Hope you have your Bibles with you. If not, reach in front of the pew there. There's a Bible. God's Word says, And Jesus went out from there. Jesus did. He departed to a region of Tyre and Sidon. All right, now I have a slide for this, Tyre and Sidon, and you don't hear a whole lot about that, but I have a slide for this. See if we can pull it up, the geographical area next to the Mediterranean Sea on the north. All right, so it's a little small, but maybe you can still see it. So if you see in the top left corner, there's Sidon, and a little further down is Tyre, and then it says Phoenicia. All right, you see the Sea of Galilee where Jesus often preached down below, but he's now gone up to that area. It's a Gentile area. It's an area that Jesus performed from what the Desire of Ages said, one miracle. And we're going to talk about that one miracle today. All right, verse 22 of chapter 15. And behold, a woman of Canaan came from the region, and she cried out to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. Now, the Canaanite people were known as idolaters, and they were greatly hated. Not just a little bit. We're talking a lot. And they were despised by the Jews. To this class, this Canaanite woman belonged. And now she came to Jesus begging for mercy. Inspired by her mother's love, she did determined to present her daughter's case to Jesus. So mother's out there. She went to Jesus for whose case? Her daughter's case. She determined not to lose hope. Desire of Ages, page 40, 400. Let's keep reading. Have mercy on me. O Lord, son of David, my daughter is severely demon-possessed. Have mercy on me. Now don't miss this. O Lord, she's identifying Jesus as Lord, son of David. Now most of us will read through that and just go, what's Canaanite woman coming to Jesus? Look at all the people flocking to Jesus to be healed. Right? We know in Matthew 9 it talks about when Jesus went into areas that healed everybody he came into contact with. Here we have a Canaanite woman who was hated by the Jews. Jesus is what? What family does he come from? Is it Jewish? And she says, son of David. Now put your bookmark in there and let's go to Matthew chapter 1. I want to point out how significant son of David is. 
go to the very first chapter of Matthew where it talks about the genealogy. Chapter 1, verse 1, the very first verse. The book and genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David. She didn't have the teachings or privilege to what the Jews had, and yet she identified him as the son of David. She's claiming him to be Lord, as it said in the Bible verse, the son of David, and now is asking for mercy from the son of David for her daughter. Read that again, Desire of Ages, page 400. Inspired by a mother's love, she determined to present her daughter's case to Jesus. She determined not to lose hope. So in this sinful, dreadful world that we live in, my prayer is for each of us, as Elder Phil read two positive verses this Sabbath, is that we do not lose our faith and hope in Jesus. Man, I didn't even hear an amen on that. Amen. Four key points stand out in my mind. First of all, the mother, this mother, came on behalf of her child. She first came to who? Not other doctors, not other people, not even her own people. She first came to Jesus. These are examples that we need to live by, by the way. First, she went to Jesus. Not the elder, not the pastor, not the deaconess, not the deaconess, not even the greeters. They're all great. But she first came to Jesus. Second, she cried out for help, asking for mercy. I love mercy. Mercy, I love your name. I love what it represents. And you fit that role, not only as a mother, but as a person. Sorry to put you on the spot, but mercy when I looked up mercy, it says, compassion or forgiveness shown towards someone who is, whom it is within one's power to punish or harm, but they show mercy. She came to Jesus asking for mercy. Three, she identified Jesus as Lord, asking Jesus for mercy saying, Son of David, which we read where that came from, claiming the promise that God had made to who? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Through the seed of Abraham, the Savior, the Son of David, would come. Do you remember that? Back in the genealogy, Jesus was in that group. Fourth, she identified her need. Not only did she come to Jesus, but she had a specific request for Jesus. That her daughter, who was severely demon-possessed, would be healed. Brothers and sisters, if Jesus is not in control of our lives, who is? So now what did Jesus say? Let's go to verse 23. Verse 23. But he, being Jesus, answered not a word. How many of you right now, you don't need to raise your hands, feel like you've asked, you went to Jesus first, you pled for mercy, and he's not answered you a word? sure she's at the feet of Jesus and he's not answered her a word but the disciples had something to say good thing you got 12 disciples there to back you up Jesus because they had something to say what's God's word say and his disciples came and urged him urged Jesus saying send her away Lord send her away for she cries out to us what are they saying? She's begging. She's pleading. 
We're tired of her. Move her away. She's a Canaanite. She's not even a Jew. Lord, you came here to get some rest. And here she is pleading for her daughter, Lord. But she is the scum of the earth. Now, I added a few words, but I don't think they would have disagreed with me. Don't forget, they were greatly hated by the Jews. There's a lot of hate in the world today. If the fruits of the Spirit and the first fruit is love, why do we see so much hate? I love the thought this Canaanite woman was not begging for herself. There's nothing wrong with praying for yourself. But this Mother's Day weekend, this is a mom's story. She was begging for her daughter. She was pleading for her daughter. She loved her daughter. She was willing to do whatever it takes for her daughter. But for the love of her daughter, the one that was demon-possessed. Maybe, just maybe, I have to wonder, did this mother know of Jesus' kindness? Had she heard about him? His endless love and mercy. Because she's begging for it. Especially mercy for the unworthy. And she knew she was unworthy. Maybe she even heard that Jesus had called Matthew. Matthew, a tax collector. They were hated too. A personal disciple, a tax collector. Matthew is the one that's writing the story. Maybe she knew about that. It's giving her hope. Matthew, one of Jesus' personal disciples. Jesus was different. Jesus was different from the Sanhedrin, from the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Jesus was different. He looked different. He talked different. He's probably the wrong color. Wasn't good looking. There was nothing exceptional about him. But everything about Jesus was an exceptional because he was different. Let's keep going. Maybe she was aware of the conversation. Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Maybe she was aware of that one. Remember that where Jesus openly rebuked the Pharisees saying, those who have no need of a physician, I have come for the sick. Jesus said, I did not come to call the righteous. I've come to call the sinners. Mark 2, 17, Matthew 9, 11, and 12. Basically, those who know and acknowledge their need of Jesus, he will make well. So she has to be wondering, my greatest need is for my daughter. Nothing else can fix her or change her. Is this Jesus that I've heard about, the son of David, master, teacher, with a disciple of Matthew? I mean, look at all of his disciples. They've even asked her to leave. Does he have mercy? Do you have mercy for others? Do I? Verse 24 of chapter 15. Now Jesus speaks. But Jesus answered and said to her, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Although this answer appears to be in accordance with the prejudice of the Jewish laws as it was applied to, by the rebuke of the disciples, reminding them of what Jesus had often told them, they had forgotten. He came to the world to seek and to save all which was lost. 
Romans 1.16 says, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of salvation to all that believe. For the Jew first, and also for the Greek and the Gentile. Have we forgotten that? He said, I'm not sent but unto the lost sheep of Israel. Are you from that bloodline today? That's right. This answer would have utterly discouraged a less earnest seeker. But the woman saw that her opportunity had come. Beneath the apparent refusal of Jesus, she saw a compassion that he could not hide. Desire of Ages, page 402. Think about it. They say communication is 7% verbal. The rest is my body language and my tone. Jesus may have said he came for the lost sheep, which was really a rebuke to his disciples because she was part of that lost sheep. But she could see his body language and his tone. It's starting to get good now. I'm getting goosebumps. Ephesians 3, 6 says, Jesus longed to unfold the deep mysteries of truth which had been hid for ages, that Gentiles should be fellow heirs with the Jews and partakers of the promise. A promise in Christ in the gospel. Verse 25, she saw through Jesus. Then she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. The disciples thought she was rebuked. They missed it. She worshipped. And she again presented her supplication, her prayer at the feet of Jesus. Lord, help my daughter. I wish you could get some of my telephone calls during the week because I think you probably do. But I wish you could hear all the helps out there. Can you pray for this? Will you help on this? Will you do this? She first went to Jesus and said, Lord, help me. When we know our need of Jesus, the help is there. But we need to know what our need is. What's your need today? You're all fighting with something. You each are struggling with something. You each have pains. Maybe you're even mad at Jesus for something. He says, come, let us reason together. I love a God that says, come, let us reason together, Isaiah 118. You want to reason with me? You want to talk with me? Because I'll tell you what, if Jesus and I are reasoning together, most likely, for sure, I'm going to be in the wrong. But he says, I still want to hear you, John. And I will listen until you become bored with your problem. Mmm. Mmm. She worshiped, 25 says. Matthew 15, 25. She came and she worshiped him, saying, Lord, help me. I appreciate that Karen Carlton has opened up her office at the school on Mondays to have prayer for her students, your students, our family. And we have different teachers, Ms. Mrs. Reiswig and Karen and Pastor and some of the parents. We come in and we pray over the children. And I can't help but remember many of those prayers. And the request, sometimes I think the parents don't know what these kids pray about, and they probably wish we didn't know, but it's okay. We keep it confidential, and we still pray over them. But I remember one request, and I've shared it many times, but it's a wonderful thought for me to remember, and it's from my buddy Nathan Sweena, who said, help. All he said was help. Four-letter word. Brother, if you're going to say a four-letter word, there's no better word than help. Help. Covers all the bases. Help me, Jesus. Help. She's saying help. She worshiped. Jesus' response was not what I expected. I'll be honest with you. It was not what I expected. It's not an easy sermon to preach on because it's hard. I appreciate my brother Bob Hatch. He and I were going over what little time I had this week. He and I were going back reading Bible commentary, reading Desire of Ages 
reading the different Bibles. Also, it's found in Mark, reading Mark's account on it. We're trying to figure out the different, the reasoning, the importance of the crumb and what it all meant. And, but Jesus' response was not what I expected. Were they bantering back and forth? Was it a little tongue-in-cheek? Was it sarcasm? I don't think so, because she fell at his feet and she worshipped. Let's read verse 26 and 27. Jesus now says to her, It's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. She's pleading for him, and he says it's not good to take the bread and throw it to the dogs. That was almost fighting words. But what does she say? I love her heart. And she said, yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Mmm. Food for thought, spiritual food for us to contemplate. Here we go. Food for thought, spiritual food for us to contemplate. Food, bread, crumbs, okay? Equals, blessings, healings, forgiveness, saving of his children. Okay, what's children? Children are chosen ones, Israelites, Jewish nation, dogs, heathens, Gentiles, and the rest of the world if you're not a Jew. Keep that up there for me. Please keep that up there. When Jesus mentioned dogs, he used a very peculiar word. Jesus did not use the word for wild or savage dog. Jesus used the word for little dog in Greek or house dog. Now that doesn't sound as harsh as wild dog. Jesus toned down the language. I believe he did this intentionally, kind of hinting at his grace. This little hint of grace was a small crumb. And yet she picked it up. She reused his words. Don't miss this. She reused his words for a dog in her reply. Notice what she says. Let's read it again. Her reply. Yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs from the master's table. Crumbs, blessings, healings, forgiveness, saving for Jesus is what? The bread of life. Amen. Blessings, healings, forgiveness, savings. For Jesus is the bread of life. I will take a crumb. Just give me something, Master. Mm. Here was her humility. Brothers and sisters, if we had more humility in the world today, we would have a lot less problems. We live for a world that says an eye for an eye. And they take the Bible out of context. But Jesus says, revenge is mine, saith the Lord. As we nailed the nails into Jesus' hands, and I keep those nails on my desk, and they're not the exact nails, but they remind me of the nails that was used. It reminds me that Jesus looked at the centurion and said to his Father in heaven, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. Jesus has a love and humility, and she's now showing it. Here was her humility and faith, that even if she can receive just that little crumb from the Lord's table, that would be sufficient. She also picked up on the fact that Jesus did not place her outside the house. I don't think the disciples picked up on that but at his table. Did you miss that? Are you getting tired? Jesus didn't put her outside the house. She's at his table. Mm. Gives us hope. That was a paramount point, and I think the disciples missed it. It was a learning, learning curve for them. She demonstrated modesty in asking only for crumbs. We often ask for the best seat, the best meal. I'll be honest, I like to sit in first class. I don't get to sit in first class very often. Heck, I'd just be glad for the extended leg room. 
We often think we deserve these things. Maybe it's because of our education. Maybe it's because of what we've done or whatever it is. I don't know. You probably don't, but I think at times I do. I struggle with humility. What is your struggle today? And do you have mercy for others that aren't of your class? She demonstrated modesty in asking only from crumbs. She felt the need for a savior, literally begging for her daughter's life. We see her humility. She owned up to being a dog. Brothers and sisters, we should own up to our sins. However, something remarkable happened. She begged not for merit, she begged for mercy. She begged not for merit, she begged for mercy. Jesus gave the mother more than she asked for. He not only answered her request for her daughter, was healed at that very hour. Let's read it, verse 28. Then Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. Even the crumbs are enough to feed those under the table and those seated at the table and enough for the rest of the world for Jesus is the bread of life. Moreover, Jesus gave her their very right to be called a child of God and don't miss this, he grabbed her chair to sit at his table. Galatians 3.29 proclaims, Moreover, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free. We are all in Christ. And if you are in Christ, then you are Abraham's seed, and you, according to the heirs, to the promise. She found the privilege to be at the master's table and receive the crumbs. She understood that humiliation is a small price to pay to save your loved ones. Now, if you missed everything else, don't miss this. She understood that humiliation is a small price to pay to save your loved ones. Who paid the ultimate price of humiliation to save his children? She understood that. The disciples missed it. She understood to pay the ultimate price that Jesus had. She understood the mission. She understood the mission, and she was a Canaanite. She didn't have all the privileges that you and I have of the Bible. Wasn't raised as a Jew. Didn't have the Torah. Didn't have the blessings that we have. And sometimes I wonder, are we going to miss the mission of Jesus Christ? Because very soon, Pastor Enrique and I are going to preach on the seven churches. And there's some really good ones. But then there's a church of Laodicea. Jesus said, I wish you were hot. Or you were cold, but since you're neither, you're lukewarm, I will spew you out. Ooh, I don't want to be that church. She understood that humiliation is a small price to pay to save your loved ones. Let's let that sink in for a minute. It was Christ's mission to save the world. As Mario said last week, thank you, Mario, for sharing God's word. Jesus came to seek and to save that which is lost. Luke 19.10 and Matthew 18.11. And brothers and sisters, that's all of us. Jesus came from heaven, humbling himself, and was treated worse than any dog has ever been. Enduring unthinkable, enduring unthinkable humiliations. Why? To save his children. For Jesus came again to seek and to save that which was lost and to now to put it into place. And to put it into place. He gave you a seat at his table. Jesus said, other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring. And they will hear my voice, Jesus said, and they will be one flock 
and one shepherd. And as I close, and now abide, may it not be lost, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. Brothers and sisters today, will you not pull up the chair and sit at the feet of Jesus at the Master's table? And God bless the reading of his word. I need to close with prayer. Lord, the crumbs are enough. But Lord, you want to give us the bread of life. Thank you for teaching me this week a story of humility. A story that often words can be misleading unless you understand and dig down deep. May we see the body language as Jesus has shown. Lord, you've pulled a seat up and you've offered us the very best. If God could come from heaven, the highest position and take the position of a servant, may we see the value in the prize of serving others. Thank you for the mercy of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and all God's people said, amen.